So your name's AJ. All right. Nice to meet you, AJ. Yeah, uh, my name's Ashish, but I go by AJ uh, with my friends. Okay, so you're from India? And, yeah, right. Um, all right, so I don't know a whole lot about Indian history, but, you know, back in, I want to say around 2008, um, you know, I really got into, uh, like, a lot of Hindu literature, like the Mahabharata, the Ramayana, mm -hmm. and the uh, Baitul Pakizi. So, you know, I really fell in love with the uh, Hindu literature, and I found a lot of it to be pretty, you know, like liberal in comparison to the Abrahamic religions. Yeah. But, you know, like the the more I learn about what's actually going on in India, you know, like with Hindu extremists and stuff, it, it doesn't seem like it's that simple, you know? No, I think uh, at the end of the day, everything depends on the interpretation that they're doing of any religious uh, scripture. Uh, there are a lot of... Uh, Islamic uh, majority countries which have a lot of uh, uh, which which are still secular uh, like uh, take Jordan for example uh, take uh, uh, I forgot the name of the country it borders Israel uh, take uh, that country for example uh, they are still liberal and they have a, a Muslim majority uh, population right. Uh, because their interpretation of the text is very different what you see in the radical interpretation of the text in some of the Middle East countries uh, uh, or even in uh, some of the uh, Christian majority countries uh, in the West. right? Uh, so uh, even th that is a problem that uh, even affects Hinduism. Uh, and you are right. Uh, the texts are very liberal. They don't uh, like say a lot of rules have to be followed. This is blasphemy. That is blasphemy. Something like that does not right. exist. There is no concept of kafirs or, you know, apostates. Uh, right. But uh, again, it is all uh, subject to interpretation. If uh, anyone who follows like uh, a scripture too religiously will uh, find a way to make sure that everyone else follows it too, because they try to fit everyone inside a box. Right. right. That like, is what the fundamentalists are doing in India as well. Yeah, like uh, I want to say uh, about several months ago, I tweeted um, that, you know, I'm against all religions, you know, even uh, even some of the peaceful ones, because, you know, all it takes is for one person to have an extreme interpretation and then the whole religion can change, you know, so. Yes. Yeah. Um, and we have uh, prime examples of that. Uh, the... Hold on, I'm uh, getting a call. Can I mute you for a second? It's like an urgent call from birth. Okay, just, yeah. Um, just a minute, okay? Uh, sorry, <laughs> my uh, manager actually forgot to add me to a meeting and now he was saying that I should join it right now. I told them that I'll be joining in the next 15 to 20 minutes. So I, our time just got shortened. I'm sorry. I'm okay, sorry. not... No, it's okay. I mean, that life happens. Yeah. So, um, I think we were talking about how, you know, even a liberal religion like, uh, you know, Hinduism can be susceptible to extreme interpretations. Yeah, right. Um, and there are a lot more liberal religions uh, apart from Hinduism, like take Buddhism, for example, right? Right. Uh, and uh, it has also suffered uh, with these things. For example, uh, you I'm not sure if you've heard about, but there are uh, religious persecutions in countries like Sri Lanka and Myanmar. The Rohingya crisis right. being one of the recent examples where uh, extremist Buddhist monks have uh, interpreted uh, something uh, in, a, in a negative way. And then they have... Uh, a lot of people have suffered because of that. And similarly, uh, in Sri Lanka, uh, there has been a lot of things like that. People have been banned for having tattoos of, uh, of Buddha. Uh, but it, it is like very normal to have a tattoo of Buddha all across the world, world right? And right. if you get, if, if, if uh, there are actually laws that you cannot have them in Sri Lanka because uh, some uh, religious fundamental monks think that it is demeaning. Wow. So, I mean, um, 
I've heard about some extreme uh, Buddhist interpretations too. And uh, don't quote me on this, but I think it was in Vietnam that I was reading about how um, some extreme Buddhists were actually committing genocide against the Muslims there. Yeah, I, I am not sure about it, but this was uh, the very case that happened in Myanmar. Yeah, that's crazy. The Rohingya crisis in 2017 started with a, a radical Buddhist monk making hateful statements and then turning the Buddhist majority population against the uh, Muslim uh, minority population. Yeah, I think something similar happened in uh, Vietnam too, but I would have to, uh, I'd have to do some more research on it because I'm pretty sure I was reading it in a, a book. And you know, Sam Harris, he's talked about this too. How you know, like uh, even with Buddhism, you know, there can be extreme interpretations. But um, you know, with with Buddhism, uh, you don't have to work as hard as you have to do with like Islam or Christianity. Right. You know, to, pervert it into something violent, you know, right. because they have like specific mandates to do certain things, you know, like, for example, in the Bible, in mm -hmm. Deuteronomy, it says that, you know, you shall not permit a witch to live, you know, so that's not, that's not a misinterpretation, you know, that's not a distortion of what it says, that's right. a direct, right. direct command to not let someone who's suspected or guilty of witchcraft to survive. Right. Yeah. Uh, the uh, Abrahamic uh, texts have been uh, a lot more strict compared uh, to any of the texts that are there in the Eastern uh, uh, religions. I mean, I'm not sure if the Eastern, Eastern calling them Eastern religions is a uh, uh, is an appropriate term, but because they originated in the East, I prefer using that term. Uh, and the difference I see between them is that the Abrahamic religions have been uh, led by cult identity. It's, uh, they all started as a cult and then they uh, became a mass movement. Uh, the Eastern religions uh, started uh, as an ideological movement and then they became uh, more of a religion. Right. So right. when you start with a cult, uh, the issue is that you are following one person and one person's interpret uh, one and uh, one or a few limited set of people's interpretation right they write something and then a hundred thousand people uh, try to interpret it interpret it in a different way and then uh, they agree on something that is uh, not uh, what at all the uh, original uh, person meant right i uh, i'm not but when i say this i do not say that uh, these texts are not very restrictive they are they are very very restrictive uh, but that is how cult religions start. And uh, when when there are ideological religions, the issue, uh, I mean, uh, the different between difference between them is that a lot of things have been written by a lot of people, and then a lot of people try to interpret, uh, interpret it. So there is a, a lot more scope. Right? There are often conflicts between the uh, same people, uh, like one person uh, in the same era said something and then the another person with the same ideology saying something else so there is a lot of conflict between them as well so right. that is something very different between the uh, abrahamic religions and the eastern religions okay so uh, okay i have a question do you feel like you know the um social issues are impacting hinduism because just as religion can influence society, you know, society can influence religion. And I think that a lot of the extreme Hinduism is in response to Islam. Yes, uh, that is true. Uh, whenever, uh, so it, it is like a knee jerk reaction. Uh, right. I mean, uh, a lot of people see Islam uh, as something that is very restrictive and then very uh, different right. from what they believe in. Uh, the eating habits are different. Uh, the uh, how do I say it? Uh, the th there is basically no co common thing between uh, Hinduism and Buddhism and Islam, right? They are very different from what Islam is, and then right. anything that uh, uh, contradicts Hinduism uh, is often seen uh, being against Hinduism uh, from uh, 
the radicals so right. when this happens what is what happens is that uh, the radicals instead of like uh, instead of uh, saying that this is uh, not right what they say is this is not uh, this is against us right. instead of pointing out that this is a flaw in their religion they say that this is affecting our religion and their religion is completely bad so right. it, it becomes a versus battle in, instead of pointing out fingers uh, like instead of pointing out flaws yeah but i mean it's not actually it's not even just india like when you look at europe a lot of you know a lot of uh cultures find it hard to coexist with islam because of the you know like imposition like uh, what's the word i'm looking for the the inability to compromise you know it's an uncompromising religion right and so i feel like you know do you think that hinduism is better at coexisting with something like buddhism because it it doesn't seem like there's much conflict between like buddhists and hindus yeah because uh, hinduism the problem that i see with hinduism is that uh, all these other religions that uh, started uh, as an offshoot off of hinduism uh, like let's say uh, jainism it's a yeah. very a small religion it, it started yeah. as an offshoot of hinduism mm-hmm. uh, Buddhism, it started as an offshoot of hinduism lord siddhartha was actually a hindu and then he uh, became a buddhist later onwards when he wanted to attend nirvana right uh, so what hinduism uh, does is to uh, coexist with these uh, religion it ignores them uh, as a separate entity it just claims that uh, they are part of hinduism okay yeah like yeah. you know I haven't uh, learned as much about the Jains as I'd like to. I know that they're uh, one of the most peaceful religions in the world. And I actually actually downloaded their texts off of Google Play. I mean, the books were really expensive, like, you know, like $60, $80 a piece. But I downloaded them because I want to learn more about it. So uh, do you know a lot about the Jains or do you just know like a brief outline of what they believe? yeah see so the basic concept of jainism is that all life is essential uh, okay they, uh, their uh, i mean their prayers are not depend based on you know uh, rules that you must follow unlike uh, certain uh, sects in hinduism or uh, islam or uh, christianity their uh, rules are basically you must not hurt the others uh which uh, if you notice a lot of uh, jain monks wear a mask all the time they cover yes. their mask so, yes so they don't inhale insects right right they don't not just insects so they don't inhale any sort of microbes as well oh wow yeah okay yeah. so uh, that is the fundamental uh, reasoning behind uh, jainism that you must not harm anyone but then uh, in certain areas what this translates into that uh, that i must not harm uh, others but i must also stop others from harming others for example uh, there are areas where jainism is a majority right in india there are certain areas uh, not uh, right. as the difference is not as big as hindu and uh, muslims because they are the two biggest religions in india but it is like let's say if there are uh, there are 41% or 51% jains in that area so what happens in that area is that automatically a minority's food uh, preferences are discarded so if you are someone who eats something that is not considered good in jains for example jains don't eat anything that is grown under the uh, roof uh, uh, under the ground right they do, they avoid potatoes they avoid uh, onions they avoid garlic because it is uh, considered to be something which can have a lot of microbes because it grows under the soil right right so even when i'm a vegetarian i'm not harming other animals it directly affects my eating habits as well okay yeah so uh, there is a certain uh, amount of radicalism uh, in jainism as well but it does not get covered much because the um, the, the population is very very low it's like uh, around 2% uh, population of india uh, are jains okay i think yeah. i remember uh when i heard uh somebody talking about i think i think they said there's like 5 million jains or something yeah right uh, about 50 uh, lakh uh, or 5 million jains uh, which is uh, almost about 2% uh, of india okay. all right 
Yeah, so like, what do you mean by extremism, though? Like, because I I remember uh, Sam Harris talking about the Janes in a lecture that he did in 2005, and I I go back to this lecture a lot because I feel like it's the best dissection of extremism and moderate religion that I've ever uh, watched. Yeah. And and he said that if somebody's an extreme Jain, you know basically they're sh they're just going to get more peaceful because the core relig the core of that religion is peace right uh, so uh, there's a the, the basic flaw in this argument is that uh, okay i i have seen extremist jains they are comparatively peaceful uh, uh, against other religions. Uh, uh, an extremist chain will be very different from an extremist Islamist. You you can see an extremist Islamist as someone who might behead you, but uh, an extremist chain uh, will uh, will stop you from following your own belief because it is against their own beliefs. So oh, wow. uh, uh, let me uh, share uh, a link with you. Okay. Uh, I am. Uh, <clears throat> uh, so I am not sure. I, I mean, I can't find it. Uh, something like uh, like this. But there are no violent chants. Okay. Because violence is something they won't commit. But. Uh, okay. The uh, suppression here is more, you know, uh, okay. behind the doors. So as I mentioned, let's say you are someone who uh, eats meat or someone who uh, eats uh, something that does not uh, go hand in hand with the gens. So in right. the community area, it is highly likely that you won't find uh, that thing or you won't be able to consume it, even if you find it, because it will it'll, it'll, uh, get a, a lot of criticism towards you. Okay, so basically, yeah. what you're saying is that their their extremism uh, involves them restricting people, and not so much violence. Yeah, right. I mean, okay. there are, the violent uh, gens is something that is completely unheard of. I mean, there may be. I'm sure uh, there are fifty uh, five. There are five million people, and there are a, a handful of them are violent. But uh, it is highly likely that. Uh, as uh, like a uh, radicalism, radicalism as uh, violent as other religions exist in Jains. Right, and I, I think that's a good thing because the uh, the core of their religion is to not do harm to others. Yeah, right. not violence is their uh, core. Ahimsa, uh, which is called ahimsa, is part of their uh, main principle. Okay, so like whereas with the Abrahamic religions, the the core of those religions is to put God above all things, you know, right. like right. The, their core thing is to put God above all things. Like you shall have no gods before me. And to, to not harm is secondary. For example, with the 10 commandments, you know, thou shall not kill is commandment number six. And I've always thought that should be commandment number one, you know, to not kill people. That should be the first right. thing on your list, you know? Right. Right. So uh, that is that since uh, non-violence is the core concept of uh, Jainism, I mean, it is the most uh, like it is the most preached thing about it. Ahimsa uh, is the the first thing that comes to my mind when people talk about Jainism. Uh, so, I mean, it, it, it is that way with it. They are not violent, but they uh, do have radicalism in them. The radicalism right. is different. It is right. more psychological and restrictive uh, compared to violent and prohibitive. Right. Yeah, I mean, uh, I mean, with that, I don't feel, I mean, I'm sure that it can be an inconvenience and it can be restrictive, but it's still not, you know, on the same level as like, flying a plane into a building, you know. Yeah, right. right. That is something you'll never see with uh, Jens. Yeah. I mean, or, you know, like in Saudi Arabia where, you know, you can be executed for blasphemy or atheism. Yeah. And right, I know right. a few years ago they put, um, they put atheism in the same category as terrorism, you know, ironically. Yeah, right. 
so that is something you won't see uh, with uh, hinduism i think uh, it is only uh, prevalent in islam and christianity where atheism is uh, very looked up, down upon in hinduism as well there is yeah uh, acceptance of it uh, as long as you are not uh, you know pointing out flaws in hinduism itself okay <laughs> Okay, yeah, that's really you start pointing out flaws in uh, Hinduism itself. You are you you are you'll be labeled things that you don't want to be labeled, or you are not. Uh, yeah. I mean, you don't want to be labeled. The current, for example, you go go by the name the secular tourist, right? So the current government has somehow catapulted the word secular into something bad. Okay. Yeah, like right. when I uh when I read like the Ramayana and the Mahabharata, like I really enjoy them. For me. It was like reading, you know, like Greek or Roman mythology. I didn't feel like. Yeah, like so Ramayana and Mahabharata are mythology. They are mythology. The events that happened are not real. Uh, they were written by a poet uh, called Tulsi Das. Uh, I mean, Ramayana was uh, written by Valmiki. Yeah, Mahabharata was written by uh, Tulsi Das. Yeah, Valmiki and Vyasa, and yeah. uh, like even like, the characters, like the characters most of them are really agreeable like uh if you read the ramayana hmm. when when ram finds out that he's being you know exiled to the forest and he's not going to be king you know his dad um you know he told him to stay another day you know just to uh be with the family and he said that sorrows do not become joys by postponement you know and you know he's just so graceful, even in the face of all the wrong that's done to him. You know he's just taking it on the nose, so to speak. Yeah, right. So uh, these are well-written characters. These are uh, these epics were written uh, to basically, uh, you know, uh, do the same thing that Aesop's fable do. Right? They were supposed yeah. to be ideological text for people to uh, abide by. They were not supposed to be religious right. texts. Uh, but then they have been converted into religious texts. A lot of uh, religious uh, concepts of Hinduism comes from the Vedas, not from the Ramayana or the Mahabharata. Because okay. the Ramayana and Mahabharata are considered uh, as, uh, like in Hinduism, they are considered as historical documents, but they are not historical documents. They are basically mythology right. written to, uh, you know, uh, promote uh, an ideal way of life, right? Right. Yeah. Of, oh, let me cut you off. Go ahead. Yeah. So I was saying a lot of uh, religious uh, concepts in Hinduism come from the Upanishads, the Vedas, and then a lot of other texts written around them. Okay. Yeah. So um, I know that the uh, the Mahabharata and the Ramayana that I read, they're like English translations, so they're like written for an English audience, but you know, I like to think that I have some semblance of what they stand for. You know, yeah. like when you read the uh, Mahabharata, the characters are also, you know, for the most part, uh, pretty graceful, pretty uh, humble, even even when they've been done wrong. Like uh, there's a character in the Mahabharata named Karna. Do you remember who that is? Yeah, yeah, right. He's Karna. the uh, step uh, brother of the Pandavas. Right, right. And then there's another character named Bhishma. Yeah, Bhishma yeah. is the father of the Kauravas. No, uh, I think he's the uncle of Karna. I'm, I'm sorry, I don't remember it much. Yeah. But Bhishma Pitama, he's called Bhishma Pitama. Yeah, and so like when Bhishma's dead on the ground, Karna is standing over him and he says, if you who had reached the summit of right living and were the embodiment of purity itself must lie wounded in this manner, it is clear that no one in this world can attain what he deserves by his merit. So in a nutshell, what he's saying is, if this thing has happened to someone as good as you, then there's no justice in the world. And this was his enemy that he was talking to, you know? Right. So yeah, I just, I really enjoyed it. And a lot of it has really stuck with me. And I just don't, I don't get the same feel as when I read like the Bible or the Quran, you know? It seems like it's more about telling you what to do yeah, because uh, the Bible, Bible and the Quran are not a one-to-one -one comparison of uh, with Ramayana and Mahabharata. They are texts that prescribe a, a right. set of rules, 
but right. mahabharata and uh, ramayana are basically stories that tell you that this is uh, an, an uh, this is how things uh, should be like ramayana is a way that tells you that uh, you must live like ram who is seen as an idol uh, human uh, and that uh, like follows uh, their parents uh, does whatever is uh, like good justice uh, right. mahabharata is uh, more about you know uh, that uh, uh, when uh, i mean you must do what is needed right even when yeah. it is uh, even when uh, it requires you to go against your own right yeah i mean i mean even in you know like when you read the old testament it says that you know if you know like it says even if it's your own brother you know you should uh have them brought before the elders if they're trying to entice people away from god right you know? and even even in the new testament it says that you know, you must hate your own father and mother. You know, you're not supposed to put anything before God. Right. Uh, so uh, that is the uh, difference between uh, the Bible and the Mahabharata. I mean, they are not one-to-one -one comparisons. If right. you want one -to -one comparisons, you must read the Upanishads uh, or the Vedas because right. they are more uh, of a text which defines a way of doing things or way of living things right yeah so with, they, in them you'll find that there are a lot of inconsistencies or there are uh, uh, flaws as well i mean one right. upanishad might say something and the other upanishad might uh, say something else right yeah yeah but i don't know like i feel like you know even though i haven't really uh gotten into the upanishads i feel like a lot of people well, not a lot of people, but a lot of the Indian people that I meet when I'm traveling or, you know, out and about, they respect me just because I've taken the time to read the Mahabharata and the Ramayana, you know, yeah, like, yeah. they always respect me and they'll say, you know, you're like the first American I've ever met who's like taking the time to read these books, you know? Yeah, right. Um I think uh, that will happen very much with you. Uh, I mean, if you come uh, to India and you put a, like uh, an attempt in uh, learning about the local culture or the local customs or right. uh, the you know uh, religious aspect of things and how to not do things because uh, Hinduism is not itself a single religion. It is made up of a lot of sects. Like there's Vaishnavas, there's Shaivites, uh, there are uh, you know uh, okay. the people who are part of uh, or monotheistic uh, Hinduism kinds like uh, the Iskon society uh, and then there are uh, there are a lot of different sects right uh, and uh, all of them differ from uh, the another in, uh, in a lot of certain ways so if you go to region like this and you invest some time in learning about these things people will respect you and I think that should uh, that would happen as well with any uh, any uh, other country or any other religion as well if you learn, invest time to learn about their local culture or if you invest time to learn about their religious history or religious uh, aspects of things they will be very happy to talk to you but as soon as you start finding flaws in them uh, <laughs> they, they, they'll uh, go bonkers and that will be the case again uh, in, uh, with uh, the Hindus as well so yeah, yeah. if you find something that you know does not make sense to you in Mahabharata and you start criticizing it you'll uh, see the same thing happening. It may not right. be as extreme as you'll see in uh, a lot of Muslim countries, but it will happen. Yeah, I mean, I feel like that's with most religions, though. Like, uh, sometimes I get Jehovah's Witnesses who come to my house, and, uh, you know, I don't start out, you know, in a very antagonistic manner. You know, I'll be talking to them about what I know about their religion and stuff, and they'll be really happy with me, and they're like, oh, that was, that was so beautiful how you phrased that, and then once they find out that I don't believe any of it, you know, that's when they kind of like go on the, you know, attack. So yeah. it's not just a thing with, uh, you know, a religion. It happens with any sort of cult following. Uh, right. Let's say uh, something like uh, an alternative, uh, alternative medicine, right? Let's say homeopathy. Homeopathy is an alternative medicine. It is vastly proven by modern medicine that it, it does not work. It is just placebo. But right. every time you talk to someone about uh, someone who uh, believes in homeopathy and says that it worked for them, and then you give examples that how it does not work, it's just placebo, you'll see that uh, right. they get aggressive, they get violent. 
so uh, people are kind to you and they are happy to uh, talk to you as long as you agree with their uh, understanding of things the right. sooner you start uh, diverging uh, or finding flaws in their understanding of things you try to shatter uh, their world and uh, then the you know defense mechanism kicks in and they become aggressive okay so um you know i read uh, not too long ago that there's also uh atheist in hinduism you know so how does that work uh i mean it's a i mean again it comes back to the point where you know uh, hinduism tries to classify everything as its own part right. as i mentioned told to you that a, gen, a, a lot of hindus see jains as hindus a lot of hindus see buddhism as hinduism right mm-hmm. the same goes with atheism it, it, Atheism is not part of Hinduism. It's a different thing, but a lot of Hindus will try to justify it as a part of Hinduism to take the uh, higher uh, moral ground. It's, okay. a, it's a very old trick that Hinduism has been trying to pull. Uh, it has been trying to do that with every sort of religion. So uh, when it comes to the lack of religion as well, it, it, I'm not surprised that it tries to do that as well. Okay. Yeah. So um. Would you would you say that it's kind of like how um you know there's like Jewish atheists in America because uh you know from what I've read most uh Jews in the, in America actually don't really believe in God you know and so they're they're considered Jewish atheists and they actually make up the majority of Jews in the country and they you know they participate in the traditions and things like that but they don't really believe in God so is is that how it is with the Hindu atheists uh yes you can say that i mean uh, the difference here is that uh, the jewish atheists don't believe yes. in god but they uh, follow the religious practice uh, practices to uh, satisfy uh, the people who do believe in their family right because uh, uh, the you know uh, the following of religion starts with patriarchy right what my father and my par- parents believed in i must believe is in, uh, in uh, right. it right that is something that is very basic fundamental of religion right no no religion will have a child uh, born as a non believer and let it be a non believer right and then when you reach a point where you start understanding things that you know uh, this is how thing is you are a non believer religion does not make sense to you right. but a lot, you see that a lot of people around you believe in them and when you uh, try to go against that you will upset a lot of people and your uh, you know life will become complicated hectic it might become difficult as well uh, if not uh, physically uh, emotionally or mentally people just try to go uh, with the wind and uh, you know right not take the hassle of uh, saying i would do it right yeah even with uh even with atheists who have like christian backgrounds you know we participate in some of the traditions like you know most atheists i know celebrate christmas you know even though we don't believe that you know jesus is the son of god right because it's become a cultural thing right, right. christmas uh, is something which is now a truly commercialized uh, event instead of being a purely religious event uh people celebrated because it uh, tells them that uh, you know there is uh, something uh, very uh, hopeful about it right even the atheists celebrated uh, because they feel that uh, you know it gives hope to people right. that there is some right. someone who is looking at how things uh, you know uh, can be better uh, so it it gives hope for them so that um, is why an atheist uh, celebrated and the same thing happens with uh hindu uh, festivities so if, i'm not sure if you heard of uh, the hindu festival diwali almost all uh, hindus if if they are believers or non believers will celebrate it because it is there it is a cultural thing it is their time where they can it is a very short uh, week uh, in their lives which uh, they can spend with their family and truly enjoy the com- uh, company of their family right it's not a lot about the religion it's about Uh, you know, uh, family and culture. So right. that is, yeah, people continue to believe in it. I'm sure a lot of atheists who uh, celebrate cr- Christmas don't do it for religious reasons. They celebrate it because they get right. to spend time with their family. Right, and plus we just we just grew up doing it, you know. And yeah. part of it is yeah. like it's a it's a cultural thing, you know, familiarity. 
right okay i think i'm running short of time i had to attend that meeting in about 15 20 minutes so okay i didn't have to just stop at this point maybe we can continue this sometime else because i really like talking to you okay uh, yeah i enjoy talking to you too i feel like i learned a lot so yeah. maybe we can have this as a recurring like a weekly discussion uh, okay yeah on uh, atheism and uh, religions of the world and it might maybe force me to read a lot more about religions as well All right well thank you for being on ashish and uh glad to meet you and you know i'd be happy to uh converse with you anytime sure 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 all right thanks. man thanks a lot yeah. man nice yep. talking to you yep. bye talk to you later. bye